Hello, welcome everybody to the uh, third uh, seminar of this uh, uh, Bootstrap series hosted by the Simon's Bootstrap Collaboration. Um, we will probably turn it into a weekly uh, event. Uh, and as always, you can follow the calendar by either the Facebook uh, group Physics in Time of Coronavirus, and I think very soon there will be a um also an analog uh, you may have seen the mathematicians have started this um website where all the seminars are posted and something similar i believe is going online soon for uh, theoretical physics uh and so uh, an announcement next week the seminar will be at a different time uh, on wednesday at 10 a.m eastern because our speaker is, is in Australia and that was the only suitable time. Otherwise, he would have to speak in the middle of the night. And it will be Damon Binder from Princeton who will tell us about the link categories uh, in quantum field theory and their relation to ON models with non-integer N. Uh, and today, uh, we are very pleased to have Henry Lynn from Princeton. Uh, he'll tell us about bootstrap random matrix models. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation to talk. Can you hear? Can you all hear me? Okay. I I can. I believe. Perfect. So thanks for the invitation to speak, and I hope everyone is doing well. Um, today I will be talking about this uh, recent work um, about solving large n matrix integrals, uh, especially models which are not tractable using any other method. And uh, I hope to also review a little bit of uh, some extremely recent work at the end of the talk. Okay, so um, the goal, like I just said, is to solve large N matrix integrals. And before telling you um, how I'm going to solve them, I should explain what a large N matrix integral is and what I mean by solving it. So uh, the first thing that I mean, the first thing I mean by large N matrix integral is an integral of the following form. So it's an integral over um, multiple Hermitian matrices, uh, let's say dA, dB with a uniform measure over the Hermitian matrices, and then uh, some action which is a polynomial uh, in the multi-matrices. Now, in general, what I mean by solving the integral is not just computing the partition function, but uh, being able to compute any insertions of operators. And in the large n limit, uh, the only operators that are interesting to uh, insert are single trace operators, because multi-trace operators um, can be obtained just from products of single trace operators. Now, um, when we meet a matrix integral like this off the street, uh, it's not clear that it even makes sense. So the zeroth order question that we should ask is whether this matrix integral is even well-defined and um, what values of the couplings. So the couplings are, for example, the coefficients of the polynomial inside this potential. Uh, for what values of the coupling is it actually well-defined? And then the first order question, of course, is to not just know whether it exists, but to determine the explicit function uh, of these expectation values, let's say, as a function of the couplings. Okay, so uh, that's what we're going to try to solve. I should emphasize that both of these questions, even the zeroth order question, is uh, highly non-trivial um, for the case of multi-matrices. And even for the case of the single matrix, it's not completely trivial. So this is in contrast to, let's say, a single matrix and a single uh, integral over a single real variable, where um, you know whether or not the uh, integral is well-defined, depending on whether V is bounded or not. Right? Um, in the case of a multi-matrix integral, it's not clear um, for what values of the coupling does the matrix even make sense. Uh, does the matrix integral even make sense? And in particular, this means that uh, trying to solve this integral using some conventional techniques, for example, Monte Carlo simulations, is always going to be very subtle at best, because uh, you know, these integrals may not exist at uh, finite n, but they, strictly speaking, exist at uh, only infinite n. So if you're going to try to Monte Carlo um, this integral by, let's say, setting n equals 7, 8, 9, it's not clear that what you're doing is uh, completely you know, legitimate. Um, so we need a better method, and the better method that I'm going to advocate for is a, a so-called uh, matrix bootstrap. Uh, it works very well, especially in the infinite n limit, and this is another difference with Monte Carlo, whereas Monte Carlo, you know, it works very well for small values of n, uh, 
it obviously gets harder and harder as you increase the size of the matrix. Uh, here, the method works extremely well at infinite n. And then we can uh, perhaps discuss one over n corrections later on. Um, the, in order to explain the method, I'm going to have to explain some ingredients. So I'm going to uh, review, first of all, the old matrix story, which is mostly just a motivation or an appetizer for why you should care about integrals of this form. Of course, you may have many other motivations for solving matrix integrals. They're related to uh, field theories by dimensional reduction. They're related by localization. There's, they come up in all sorts of places in physics and even outside of physics. Um, then I'm going to explain the loop equations, uh, especially in the multi-matrix case. There are some interesting uh, subtleties. And I'm going to explain what are the positivity constraints that are required for these sort of expectation values of, um, of uh, matrices. And then assembling these ingredients will have some algorithm, which we can then apply to single matrix models which are, of course, analytically solvable. So this is mostly just a test of the method to make sure that uh, it reproduces the known analytic solutions. Uh, and then we will also try to apply it uh, to models which cannot be solved. And these are basically all models, even um, at two matrices, with a very few exceptions, are unsolvable. So uh, the vast majority of matrix integrals, we have no way of treating uh, analytically. Um, since this is a bootstrap uh, seminar, I thought that I would just uh, try to flesh out a little bit the analogy between the CFT bootstrap and what I'm calling the matrix bootstrap. And of course, this is a rough analogy, um, but I think the ingredients are at least morally similar. So in CFT, because we have uh, uh, a large symmetry group, which is usually the conformal group or the superconformal group, um, we have various nice properties, right? Uh, in order to define the correlation functions of the theory, we don't need to give a recipe for all the correlation functions. We only need to uh, give like three-point functions and two-point functions. And uh, in the matrix integral case, there's a similar simplification because we have a large n um, unitary group. We only need to consider single trace correlation functions. Um, similarly, we have some positivity constraints, which I will explain. Um, and we have some consistency conditions on the correlation functions. So uh, I think there's a nice moral similarity. And I also have a little bit more to say about this at the end. Um, OK, so let's uh, review very briefly what some motivation is for solving these large n integrals. And the motivation goes all the way back to Toft in 1974, where uh, he explained and he speculated that uh, large n matrix theories have something to do with string theory. And uh, the most basic reason for why you might expect that is because um, uh, at, at large n, when you sum Feynman diagrams, you don't need to sum all Feynman diagrams. You just need to sign the, uh, sum the planar ones. And uh, if you want to compute 1 over n corrections, of course, that becomes a topological expansion. So uh, just to be a little bit explicit about this in a very simple multi-matrix case, uh, let's review the uh, so-called uh, Ising model on a planar random surface. So uh, in this model, we have a very simple uh, matrix integral with just two Hermitian random matrices, which is given uh, by the following potential. And if we start summing Feynman diagrams, let's first focus just on uh, the cubic interaction uh, of this matrix model. So obviously, we're supposed to sum Feynman diagrams, which has uh, three edges coming out of each vertex. And we're only supposed to sum the planar ones. Now, um, when we sum the diagrams, there are two types of interactions. There's an A interaction and a B vertex, right? So if there's an A vertex, let's say that we put a minus sign uh, on the vertex. And if there's a, a B interaction, let's say we put a plus sign. So we're going to decorate now uh, the diagram with these plus and minus signs. And it's clear that we should consider all possible uh, choices of pluses and minuses, right? Um, and furthermore, Whenever there's a plus with a plus, right, that means that there is a B vertex with another B vertex. That means we should use uh, the propagator connecting two Bs, which is just one, right? Um, however, if there is a plus next to a minus, right, that means we have to use a propagator which connects A to B, which is given by the C. So um, altogether, when we uh, assign a weight to this particular Feynman diagram, we obviously have some. Uh, weights that depend on whether or not they're pluses and minuses or pluses and pluses, and those contribute differently. And the basic idea 
is to interpret this uh, coefficient here, which is uh, associated with a particular Feynman diagram as the Boltzmann factor of the usual uh, Ising model. And the sum over field configurations in the Ising model is interpreted then as a sum over Feynman diagrams, uh, Feynman graphs. And we also interpret the dynamical degrees of freedom associated with the particular planar configuration as some sort of gravitational degrees of freedom or sum over the metric. So more precisely, when we go to the double scaling limit, or just uh, if we stick to large n, if we just approach the critical point, uh, the typical size of this diagram will become very large. And we might think that this is related to some sort of continuum calculation. Um, and in particular, if we not just tune the, the, these couplings G so that the typical planar diagram is very large, but we also tune this uh, parameter C so that we tune the Ising model to the critical point, we might expect that the model that we get is some sort of uh, Ising CFT, right? It's one of the minimum models uh, coupled to Louisville gravity. And this is indeed what was uh, discussed very extensively in the 90s. And uh, there's a nice long story about this. But um, more generally, you might think that if you have some multi-matrix model and you have some interactions, well, if I just start tuning to criticality, I might find some interesting uh, theory, which is something like uh, some CFT coupled to gravity. And uh, well, this is some program that you could imagine doing. Um, it is complicated by the main fact that it's quite difficult to solve multi-matrix models besides very simple ones. So the Ising model is a simple case where you can actually solve the multi-matrix integral. But in general, we actually don't know how to solve the matrix model, and we don't know how to approach criticality. So uh, this is just one motivation for why you might care about uh, doing multi-matrix integrals. Um, I think this is a good point to stop for questions, if there are any questions. Um, if not, I will explain the ingredients. Yeah, I forgot to mention that people should feel free to unmute themselves and ask questions. That's the way we do it. OK, well, if there are no questions, I will continue. Um, so let me now explain the loop equations, which are just a very basic thing in uh, large n matrix integrals. They're the, the same thing as the Schwinger-Dyson equations, uh, just applied to this context. So uh, they're you know, just like the Schwinger-Dyson equations, you derive them simply by integrating a total derivative. Um, but there's a nice diagrammatic interpretation for uh, the loop equations, which I'll now explain. So um, let's consider the simplest possible matrix integral, which is just a, Hermitian, a single Hermitian matrix integral, uh, let's say with a cubic interaction. OK, so uh, our goal is to compute some uh, correlator or, or to study some correlator like this, which is a trace of the matrix to some power. And the power is determined by the number of uh, edges coming into the diagram. And the idea is to follow one of the edges into the diagram. I've indicated that by this uh, little arrow. When we follow this edge into the diagram, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that the edge never encounters a vertex. And therefore, it must become another one of the edges. Uh, so that's the first possibility that's indicated in this uh, picture here. So it just passes through the diagram. And because we are at strict large n, um, we know something more, which is that the diagram is planar. And the only way that this diagram could be planar is if this uh, line uh, splits the diagram into two pieces. So um, we get some term, which is a sum over the different ways of uh, splitting the diagram into two pieces. And then uh, the other possibility is, of course, that it encounters the vertex. If it encounters the vertex, what happens is it increases the number uh, of external lines by one if it's a cubic interaction. In general, it might uh, increase it by more. OK, so um, the, for, the structure of the loop equations is that uh, we get some relation between correlation functions of higher degree observables uh, to lower degree observables. Um, and there's some quadratic term here. OK, so uh, generalizing to the multi-matrix case uh, is fairly simple. We just have different colors uh, for the different matrices in this diagram, right? And when we split the diagram into two pieces, uh, we have, of course, the blue line has to end on another blue line. It can't end on a red line um, unless there's some interaction vertex, right? So uh, the structure of the loop equations in the multi-matrix case is uh, very analogous to the single matrix case. Uh, 
Um, the main difference is that there are many, many more correlators uh, for multi-matrices at a fixed degree compared to uh, the single matrix, in which case, you know, trace of m to the k is the only correlator uh, of degree k, right? Uh, whereas uh, for a multi-matrix, you can have trace a, b, a, b, a, b, a, or something. Um, now, there's a little concept that I want to coin, which is called the search space. Um, and the search space um, relies on this property of uh, the loop equations, which is that uh, higher point functions are sort of determined by lower point functions. So um, the search space is just the initial conditions to this sort of recursion relation, such that uh, if we know the in initial conditions, we can solve the entire recursion. Um, slightly more precisely, um, it's the minimal set of correlators uh, such that the loop equations determine, fully determine all other uh, correlation functions, single trace correlation functions, um, given these uh, minimal set. And it's not, in the, in the multi-matrix case, it's somewhat complicated to determine the set uh, precisely. Uh, there, there could be many choices of the set, but uh, the minimal set, uh, the, the, the size of the minimal set should be well defined. So in the single matrix model, we can, it's a very simple counting exercise to just uh, determine that the, uh, that the dimension of the search space is just determined by the polynomial uh, that goes in the interaction. So it's just determined by um, the highest degree that shows up in the polynomial. Uh, in the multi-matrix case, it's somewhat more complicated. And I don't know how to give a precise counting of the uh, dimension of the search space. But you can get a crude estimate um, as follows. So um, what we want to do is we want to consider some particular correlator. So let's say we uh, consider some multi-matrix correlator that has k external lines. Well, um, in general, these lines will be different colors, right? Perhaps if they're m different types of matrices, they could be different colors. Um, and what we do is we follow one of these lines in. But in general, we can follow any one of the external lines in, and we will get a different equation, um, except for some small number of degeneracies. We'll get a different equation. So this means that the number of equations, the number of loop equations that we get at a given degree is k, uh, the number of external lines, times the number of correlation functions at that degree. And they're roughly m to the k correlation functions divided by k. You divide by k because uh, the trace is cyclic. So uh, trace ABC is the same as trace BCA. Right? Um, uh, the number of new unknowns that you introduce when you uh, do this is the number of correlation functions at degree k plus d if you have a p potential um, which is of order d. So um, you see that this equation has a solution when uh, k is proportional to m to the d. So this means that if you go uh, to high enough degree, we expect to be able to solve the equation. In other words, there are not uh, too many unknowns. Now, this is a very crude argument. Uh, there are many things that are crude about it. For one thing, this counting of the correlator, correlators is not correct, uh, at least not precisely correct. But uh, uh, this crude estimate at least gives you some reason to hope that the dimension of the search space is finite, even for the multi-matrix case. In other words, if you just know, let's say, 20, uh, correlators, you can determine all the rest of the correlators. OK, uh, so now let me discuss the positivity constraints um, for this model. So um, what we, the positivity constraints um, are very simple. If you have a Hermitian matrix, uh, M, let's say, it's obvious that a trace of M to any even power is going to be uh, a positive quantity. And that is not enforced by the looping equations in any way. So the basic idea is to try to impose as much positivity requirements as you can. And the most general uh, positivity requirement is uh, obtained by considering an arbitrary superposition of, let's say, powers of matrices in the single matrix case. And then um, noting that trace of that matrix phi, phi dagger phi, has to be positive. So uh, that, in turn, gives you a condition on a new matrix, uh, Cal M. Cal M is a matrix of correlators. So you should not confuse Cal M with the actual matrix that's being integrated over. It's just a big table which has entries which are given by the correlators of your matrix model. And um, that matrix 
has to be posi positive semi-definite in order for um, this inner product to be well-defined, okay? So that's the basic positivity requirement that we're going to impose. And uh, we will see that, well, this, this condition is obviously stronger than just imposing that all the traces of, uh, let's say, A squared is positive, A to the fourth is positive, right? Uh, this condition that a matrix is positive semi-definite is equivalent to setting a bunch of determinants um, being positive. All the determinants of the upper triangular matrices have to be positive. So it gives you a bunch of polynomial constraints, whereas a uh, trace of A to some positive integer is just some linear constraint. OK, for the multi-matrix case, uh, the generalization is obvious. You just consider arbitrary strings um, of the schematic form, where you uh, take superpositions of not just A to powers, but A, B, A, B, A, B, et cetera. Um, now, this is uh, related to a little bit of uh, 19th century mathematics. So uh, this is sort of an amusing aside. Uh, it's related to the so-called hamburger moment problem. So the idea is, uh, in the single matrix case, you can think of this positivity as follows. Uh, in the single matrix case, um, the master field, or the, the, the object which determines all expectation values of all single trace uh, correlation functions, is simply the eigenvalue density, right? The eigenvalue density of the matrix. And now, if you think of that as some distribution, you can ask the question, if I give you a list, you know, a list of uh, expectation values of the matrices, so I give you a list that tells you that the first entry is trace m, trace m the second is trace m squared, the third is trace m cubed, and so forth. Um, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions on this list so that it is uh, consistent with uh, that eigenvalue distribution being positive, right? You can obviously always write the, uh, this list of MNs or TKs in, in our notation uh, as uh, an integral over some distribution, but we want the distribution to be strictly positive. And while this problem was considered uh, by Hamburger and uh, the necessary and sufficient conditions uh, turns out to be exactly the condition that I just said. So uh, you can think of the multi-matrix generalization as a um, sort of non-commutative generalization of the hamburger moment problem, where you ask, you know, if I give you a list uh, purporting to be the moments of some, uh, uh, some multi-variable random matrices, uh, you know, prove or disprove that I'm lying, you know, is the list consistent or inconsistent with the positivity? And uh, as far as I know, especially when you consider the truncated problem where you only give you, uh, I only give you a finite subset of this list and not the full list, um, as far as I know, this problem is uh, still open. So it would be interesting to try to understand exactly uh, whether the conditions I just mentioned are actually, they're, they're clearly necessary. The, the question is whether they're sufficient or not. Uh, OK. Um, now uh, I can explain the application uh, of this method to the uh, single matrix integral. Um, but maybe it's also a good time to pause and see if there are any questions. It also appears that my uh, screen share is not, is frozen, so. May I, can I be heard? Edouard uh, yes. Bretin? Yes. I have a simple question on the positivity. Sure. Um, you have studied, I've read your papers, you have studied the case of, take the simple G5 force, one matrix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you have studied it for G positive and G negative. That's right. For G positive, it's clear that there is an integral because there is a, there is a measure, which is yes. the, the matrix integral, and therefore the positivity of the loop applied to the loop equation is obvious. Yes. On negative G, which is of course of interest because of the criticality, yes. uh, the, there is no positive measure. So how do we know that the positivity condition would apply? Yeah. That's... Model, I mean, this model is so simple that you are right, but in a model on which we don't know, uh, many matrices and no obvious positivity, how do we know it's that it's obvious to apply positivity conditions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, 
yeah, it's a good question. For the single matrix case, of course, uh, the positivity that we're imposing is just positivity of the eigenvalue distribution. So sure. um, in that case, it seems quite reasonable. Uh, in the multi matrix case, I agree that it's, uh, well, if you like, it's a sort of, um, it, it, we simply define the integral to satisfy this uh, property. It's possible that you could find uh, solutions which don't satisfy this property. Um, in fact, I'm fairly confident that, uh, yeah, even in the single matrix case, right, I will discuss this in a minute, but even in the single matrix case, you can, sometimes it's interesting to consider solutions which don't satisfy this positivity requirement. Um, yeah, that, that, for example, is um, equivalent to putting some eigenvalues on the top of the potential, let's say, as opposed to just in the minima of the potential, right? And that, uh, that comes up in certain contexts. So, yeah, I would say that, um, yeah, it, it's definitely a reasonable question. I would s simply say that I'm taking it as a, a definition that the solution should satisfy these properties. Okay, thank you. Hi, hey, I have a related question. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the talk the, this uh, Ising matrix model. We have uh, matrices A and B and the cubic potential. Uh -huh. So yeah, this model uh, naively looks like it doesn't converge at finite n. Yes. So, so do you expect positivity in the large well, limit, or why? I, I can why say do you that, expect it? Yeah, I can say that uh, if you impose positivity, you get the analytic solution. So, um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. this is explicit in the one matrix model case. It's very explicit. I mean, you, you, the exact solution of all the one matrix models, um, you assume that the eigenvalue distribution is positive. You, you can, what, uh, I, I will maybe, maybe hold off on this question and we can discuss it more at the end because I, I will have a little bit more to say about that. Um, Thanks. Yeah, in, in all cases where there's an analytic solution, you can reproduce it using this positivity, even though it's formally, it's a good point that it's formally, um, it's somewhat formal to impose a positivity constraints when you don't, strictly speaking, have a well-defined measure. Um, I'm having some technical difficulties right now where I'm not able to advance the slide. Um, so uh, let me try to restart it one second. Okay, great. Hopefully this is working now. You working? Yes. Thanks. Okay, so um, let's now discuss the one matrix case. Uh, first, we consider the case where G is positive. So uh, the green line in this plot is the exact solution to the one matrix integral. And uh, the various colors of gray show constraints as you increase the size of the inner product matrix, this Cal M that we were just discussing. Um, and when you increase the size of the Cal M, you obviously expect the region to uh, shrink. And you can see uh, from this plot that actually uh, just imposing like 10, uh, considering a 10 by 10 positivity matrix, you get very, very close. This uh, black, black region here um, gets very, very close to the exact solution. Um, so there's very strong evidence uh, that uh, convergence to the uh, exact solution is very rapid and occurs. Um, if you want to look under the hood a little bit more, you can ask about what constraints are activated. So uh, in particular, we just look at uh, very simple positivity constraints now. So we just look at the constraint that let's say a trace of uh, m to the 72 power is positive. So that's given by this, uh, uh, this blue curve here, right? And this blue curve here is obtained uh, by um, simply looking at the loop equation for trace of 72 and solving it in terms of uh, the trace of m squared, right? So that's some polynomial. And uh, we also have some dependence in G. So this polynomial, uh, you should think of T72 as a polynomial in uh, trace of m squared, which has many, many zeros, right? Uh, it's a high order polynomial, so it has many zeros. And at a given value of uh, trace m squared, we're simply looking at the zeros of this uh, function, which gives us these sort of finger-like shapes. And the locations of the zeros also depends on the coupling. So uh, this axis is the coupling. Um, so you get this sort of interesting uh, shape. And if you look at uh, various different correlators, well, you can see that uh, 
you get various different shapes. And if you take the union of all of, or sorry, the intersection of all these allowed regions, you will get some constraint which is very close to the exact solution. Um, now let's uh, explore the case of negative G. So um, as we were just discussing, uh, this is a bit subtle, but we just blindly apply the positivity constraints. Uh, and here's what we find. So uh, here we apply some, uh, some very simple constraints that's uh, very similar to the previous slide where we just consider positive, positivity from individual traces of even powers of matrices. And uh, we get the sort of peninsula-like structure where um, uh, there's some critical value of G where the model stops being well-defined. So the analytic solution just uh, exists up to the critical point, right? And then it's no longer well-defined. And what we're finding is that the constraints um, have this peninsula-like feature where um, they round off the corner. And um, the more constraints that you impose, the closer this peninsula gets to, um, to the actual critical value of G. So in other words, um, when you impose some finite number of constraints, you see that it's possible that maybe the theory makes sense at uh, you know, a value of G that's slightly bigger than uh, the critical value of G, uh, let's say right here. Right. As you impose more and more constraints, you eventually see that the theory really doesn't make sense uh, at any values um, greater than the critical value. So in particular, right, if you look at some line here, that's saying that no matter what value of trace m square you assign, you're going to run into some sort of negativity trouble. There are no positive solutions uh, to this model. But yeah, so if you version, wish. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was saying convergence here seems to be much worse, or, or is it not? Oh, uh, so, no, no. So, so I've just actually shown uh, this. Uh, yeah, this is misleading because I, I've just been showing single trace constraints. If oh. you impose the, the matrix constraint that I showed in the beginning, yeah, it, 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 it actually has it converges so quickly that it's a little bit hard to see. So, it, it, uh, yeah. Thank you. I just showed this uh, for sort of aesthetic reasons. Um, yeah. Um, so if you wish, you can simply, even if you don't believe that this model should have a positive measure, you can simply use this method to test whether it makes sense for a solution to exist, uh, assuming that you have the positive measure. Um, whether or not the measure is actually well-defined does not enter into this calculation. Um, now, a slightly more non-trivial case is the so-called two-cut model. So in the two-cut model, we study this inverted potential, right? And, uh, depending on the range of uh, parameters for G, you can have a situation in which uh, we know from the exact solution that there's actually not one single solution, but uh, moduli of solutions. Uh, and this moduli corresponds to a uh, filling fraction. So depending on how much uh, of the eigenvalues within this minima versus this minima, uh, your value of trace A can be slightly negative or slightly positive, right? And so here we're seeing a convergence to uh, not a single point, but to the moduli of solutions that are allowed by positivity. So this green line, again, is uh, are this, uh, the moduli of solutions. And uh, these gray regions shrink completely, uh, not to, but again, to this functional curve. In general, if you have a potential with many, many different uh, minima, you will have uh, you know, many, many moduli corresponding to the filling fractions of each of the minima. Now, uh, I want to discuss a little bit more of this uh, concept of filling fractions, although it's a little bit of an aside. So um, in particular, the fraction concept uh, gives you a nice way to think about the dimension of the search space. So the dimension of the search space can be interpreted as the number of filling fractions in the positive solutions plus one uh, in this case. You can also that uh, you have any positive, uh, the, dropping the constraint on, of positivity on you see it looks a little gas where you have charged particles uh, um, coupled to this potential and some uh, eigenvalue repulsion. Negative charges. So the negative charges will feel uh, a minimum instead of a maximum, right? So 
uh, sorry, they will feel a maximum instead of a minimum. So in other words, there will be some stable configuration where you put some anti-eigenvalues uh, near the top of the potential and some uh, normal eigenvalues sort of uh, near the bottoms of the potential. Um, so uh, if you allow for this obvious, uh, when you um, impose the equations of motion on your solution, right, it's uh, clear that you have forgotten the positivity constraints, right? If you solve the equations of motion for rho, you usually don't, uh, just the variational principle alone does not tell you that rho has to be positive. You have to impose this by hand uh, to eliminate some of these uh, unphysical solutions. And the point is that the dimension of the search space can be interpreted as exactly the number of unphysical solutions. The resulting uh, curve that you get the, at the end of the day, once you've imposed all the positive positivity, just eliminates the possibility called anti-eigenvalues. OK. Um, now I'd like to uh, discuss a little Uh, I see that there's some difficulty with the slide syncing again. Um, okay, good. Uh, yeah, so there's some. So you might wonder why does this method converge at all, right? Even for the case where the measure is positive and so forth, um, it's not obvious that positivity is strong enough to uh, converge to the exact solution. Why does it not say converge to some little interval and just stop? And this is correlators. So correlators meaning um, the various uh, traces of different operators. That's some very high dimensional space. And the constraint that uh, uh, this inner product is positive semi-definite um, means that the allowed region in this high dimensional space of correlators is some cone. And you would expect that the method works very well if uh, the exact solution is somehow uh, near the boundary of this high dimensional cone. If it's near the boundary of this high dimensional cone, then if you were just slightly off in your guess of one of the correlators, then uh, since there's so many dimensions, it would be likely that you would leave the uh, allowed region and you would be ruled out by the uh, library code of this cone. And, uh, Another way to ask this question is, why are there eigenvalues of this inner product matrix that are extremely close to zero? So we call these nearly null eigenvectors. And in fact, uh, the explanation is quite elementary. If you look at, in the case of, at least in the case of the single matrix model, it's quite elementary. So in the single matrix model, one feature is that the eigenvalue distribution has compact support, right? So for example, the Gaussian matrix model, as you all know, has the semicircle distribution. Uh, uh, um, so, so for example, I'm considering now some polynomial in the matrices, and I'm plotting this polynomial phi as a function of lambda. And if this polynomial has almost going to be close to zero. Hi, sorry about this. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, um, if you consider some polynomial which almost vanishes in the region where the eigenvalues are supported, then clearly this. Uh, will give you a nearly null vector just because there's no support, right? So, um, and in particular, as you increase the degree of the polynomial, you'll be able to find more and more of them which almost vanish, and the accuracy to which they vanish in this region will be higher and higher. 
So this explains why, as you increase the size of the matrix, uh, you get some, ver some eigenvectors which are almost uh, zero. They're, they have almost zero norm, and therefore they're extremely sensitive to any errors that you make. Um, so I think the nation in the single matrix case for why that you expect yeah. the method to converge. Uh, in the multi-matrix, yes. May I interrupt for a second? Because I, Sorry, if you I can say that again. I didn't, I didn't hear what you said, but there are cases with double well potential in which rho of lambda doesn't have a, a connected support. Could be, be made of pieces. Would that, would that yes. apply well? This is my next slide. Yes, next this is my next slide. Right. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Go ahead. No worries. Yeah, uh, so in this slide, you see exactly that case where the oh. eigenvalue distribution has okay. two supports. And again, you can find some uh, polynomials, which, so here you actually look at the Sorry, not potential, some uh, polynomials which almost vanish in the region where, those, where the eigenvalues have support. Okay, so now let's consider um, we've sort of graduated from the single matrix case. Now, that's all. Um, so, just as one more warm up, we can go back to the Ising model. Um, the simplification. The Ising model can, of course, be solved analytically. It's one of the few sessions for this model close on a particular subset of the correlator. So um, if you consider some uh, correlation function, which let's say has a bunch of A's and a bunch of B's, but you never have uh, A's and B's mixed up together, right? So Maybe you have trace of a to the four, b to the four, but not a, b, a, b, a, or something like that, right? Then if you consider the loop equations, uh, if you follow uh, one of the lines in to this blob, right, uh, you will see that the, the worst that can happen is that this uh, a line can become a b line, right? Or it can uh, make two a lines, but it preserves the structure where the a's and b's don't get nested inside of each other. So there's a very tiny subset of correlators in which the loop equations close, and you only need to consider these uh, subsets of correlators um, in order to get constraints. And so doing this uh, very quickly on a uh, laptop, you know, a few seconds, you can get these nice uh, plots where you see a uh, convergence to exact solution. So uh, here, I'm there. the search space is two-dimensional. In the case of the Ising model, there's trace and trace AB, and once you know those two, you determine the rest. And uh, what, yeah. Um, you see very quickly that uh, you get convergence to the exact solution. Um, now, more generally, um, if you consider just the arbitrary two matrix model, there are some um, sort of technical challenges that you have to overcome. None of them, I think, are in principle challenges, but they nonetheless are somewhat uh, important. So first, um, the size of the inner product matrix is growing exponentially just because there are exponentially num the number of correlators at a fixed degree is growing exponentially. So uh, you, well, in, you have to test for positivity um, on some very large matrix. And, and well, just that can be somewhat expensive, but it's also uh, so that, uh, for example, if you compute the minimal eigenvector, that you do so in a way uh, such that numerical inaccuracies don't uh, give you a positive eigenvalue or negative eigenvalue if you're right on the edge, right? So there's some numerical stability issues. Um, more conceptually, the search space is very high dimensional, typically. So in the models that we've been discussing before, the search space is basically the number of filling fractions, which is very small, right? Whereas in the multi-matrix case, uh, in general, you can have uh, you know, 20 dimensional search space, 30 dimensional search space, even for a two matrix model, right? Um, so that just means that you have to work a little harder but uh, in principle, you just, uh, you know, you're trying to characterize some little region in some higher dimensional space. It can be somewhat annoying, but it's not, in, it's not a fundamental obstruction. Um, yeah, you, th there are obvious ways of improving these algorithms. Uh, I, I, let me not discuss them uh, too much. But there is one subtlety of, you know, if you try to, let's say you just try to naively uh, maximize the minimal eigenvectors. So you try to find, 
sort of a best estimate point where your matrix, your inner product matrix is as positive as possible. You don't know whether you found a local minimum or a global minimum in general, right? When you have a very high dimensional space, it's very hard to tell. So uh, that's one uh, issue that you might, the thing that you do in practice is you try many initial conditions and you hope that, uh, you hope what you find is uh, close to the global minimum. Now, um, yeah, for the multi-matrix case, uh, just as a proof of concept, we can study this simple model, which has an A squared B interaction plus B A squared interaction. And to my knowledge, at least, uh, this model is not solvable using uh, any of the conventional techniques, um, especially at least for a general potential WA. So a, a general single matrix potential, I don't believe you can solve this model. Um, if you look at the case where the potential W of A is cubic, uh, you can solve the model. But for example, if the model is just, if W is quartic, I don't believe that it's solvable. Uh, in the case where it's cubic, it turns out by field redefinitions, it's related to the Ising model. For the quartic case, uh, it cannot be related to the Ising model as far as I know. Um, and in particular, the search space is much higher already for the, the quartic case. So you have an eight dimensional search space. And um, yeah, it would be interesting to study models like this and try to find new critical points if they exist. So um, in the cubic case, you can very easily, uh, again, make very similar to before, where you increase the constraints and the region shrinks and shrinks. Uh, in the case, uh, you, you can also study not convergence as you shrink, um, as you impose more and more constraints, but you can study convergence as you approach a critical point, right? And as you approach the critical point, even with fixed number of constraints, the whole uh, islands are shrinking for a very similar reason to what I described in the single matrix case. Now for the uh, quartic matrix case, uh, this is the case where you can't solve it. Uh, the numerical computation is a little bit uh, trickier, but still you see very qualitatively similar pictures. So you, you again see these islands uh, where the, you know, as you increase the number of constraints, they shrink. And uh, here I've just plotted the constraints on the trace A and trace A squared correlators. But as I mentioned before, there's an eight dimensional space. So I'm not showing the other six dimensions, right? And um, I should just note that uh, I'm considering very, very tiny matrices, only 35 by 35 matrices, and I'm getting rather tight constraints. So you could easily imagine that uh, with just a little bit more co computational power, I mean, these are basically laptop experiments, uh, with just a little bit more computational power, you could easily, I would expect that uh, these would continue to shrink and shrink um, to some exact solution. Okay, uh, now let me discuss um, some future directions. So uh, one direction that I've already mentioned is that you might uh, search for new critical points using this method. You just plug in some arbitrary matrix model, try to push it to criticality, try to extract critical exponents. Um, there is a question of whether this model can uh, be, whether this method can be used to solve fermionic matrix integrals uh, or matrix integrals with complex couplings, in which case we don't have, uh, at least naively, we don't have uh, any sort of positivity uh, constraints. So um, for example, in the fermion case, right, if you integrate out the fermions, you generally get some determinant. Let's say, let's say the fermion is coupled quadratically. Uh, the, 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 the fermion only enters quadratically into the action, but interacts with some of the bosonic matrices. Um, if you integrate out the fermions, you don't get some positive measure thing in general. So even if you study the bosonic correlators in that theory, it's not clear whether they should satisfy positivity or not. Um, similarly, you could ask about some, when you make these couplings complex. Um, furthermore, uh, we could ask about one over n corrections. So I've only been discussing the strict large n limit, but uh, at one over n, there are, of course, there's still loop equations which uh, relate one over n corrections to other one over n corrections, as well as to the, you know, uh, to the planar solution. And we could try imagine imposing positivity on the one over n corrections. Uh, there are also more positivity constraints. So uh, I've only been discussing constraints on single trace correlators. But once you go beyond one over n, you have to consider multi-trace correlators. And those satisfy their own interesting positivity constraints. And there's a sort of rich structure, presumably, um, that can be exploited to compute one over n corrections. Uh, I don't know if you can go, you can do much better, for example, if you can go to the double scaling limit or something using this method, but it's worth thinking about. Now, um, obviously, uh, you know, matrix integrals, zero dimensional integrals are great, but uh, 
we may want to do more than that eventually, uh, go to higher dimensions. So we could try to solve the C equals one model. We could try to solve the um, BFSS matrix model. And eventually, you know, a dream would be to solve, you know, large N QCD or something using a type of bootstrap method kind of like this. Uh, I don't have too much to say about large N QCD, but I will mention uh, the matrix case uh, in a little bit. Um, one naive approach would just be to take uh, your Euclidean time in the matrix case and uh, discretize it. And then you have some, uh, uh, then you have some multi-matrix integral as before, and you could attempt to solve it using the methods that I said. But there's a less naive approach that was pursued in a recent paper. Um, there are also lots of technical questions. So we would like to you know, estimate the dimension of the search space. We would like to have some argument that the method uh, converges, at least maybe asymptotically converges. I, I, it'd be nice to quantify a little bit how fast the convergence is and to see if we could try to sort of argue more rigorously why there should be a convergence in the case of multi-matrices where we don't have a good understanding of the analytic solution. And of course, there are lots of practicalities like using the Lanczos algorithm to speed things up. There, some of these things are work in progress, um, but they're somewhat technical um, questions. I wanted to spend a few minutes now just discussing this uh, very recent work. I think last week uh, there's this paper that showed up on the archive following up on um, my paper, which uh, explained how uh, to use a variant of this method uh, to solve matrix quantum mechanics. And I think it's a very beautiful paper. I uh, encourage you to read it if you're interested. Um, so in the talk that I, I've just been giving, uh, we have only been using positivity of the measure, uh, or we've been assuming that there's positivity of the measure. Um, and we haven't discussed any other types of positivity. When you go to quantum mechanics, you not just have positivity of the measure, uh, you also have reflection positivity, right? Where that's just unitarity. And that says, for example, that uh, correlation functions like this have to be positive. So it's a different type of positivity that exists once you have a unitary theory, right? And the idea is to exploit that uh, special feature of quantum mechanics. Uh, in a way which would allow you to constrain correlation functions in a very similar, once you use that uh, in, instead of the uh, positivity of the measure that I've been discussing, the story becomes somewhat, at least qualitatively, quite similar. Uh, uh, one advantage of this approach is that we're talking about positivity of uh, Hermitian operators on Hilbert space. So we don't really, there, there's no real problem with fermions. Whereas just before I was saying, you know, if you want to solve like the IKKT matrix integral, which has fermions, it's not 100% clear whether it's um, doable because there's positivity problems. Here, um, obviously the inner product of uh, quantum mechanics is always positive, whether or not they're fermions. Um, there's also an additional feature. Uh, in general, you want to exploit any symmetries that you have in the model. So in the case which I discussed, which uh, was this cubic potential, there are some discrete symmetries like Z mod two, you know, where you can switch A and B, or you can take A, trans a to A transpose, B to B transpose. These sort of discrete symmetries help you a little bit in solving the loop equation. Uh, in the quantum mechanics, of course, you have this nice uh, time translation symmetry, which uh, seems a bit trivial, but actually uh, these authors used it uh, to derive some interesting constraints. So you just take any operator that you want, right? And it's obviously time translation variant when you put it on the Euclidean circle. But uh, that implies that uh, the commutator of H with that operator has to be zero. And uh, if H contains, you know, imagine, for example, that uh, we're just studying the anharmonic oscillator, right? H would contain terms like x squared and x to the fourth. So if you commute it with P um, or some x, x to some power, P to some power, um, you general get, you get the structure very similar to the loop equations where you get uh, lower point correlation functions being related to higher and higher point correlation functions. Now, a downside of this approach is uh, without using the full Schwinger, this is sort of like a word identity, right? But without using the full Schwinger Dyson equations, you can't uh, compute um, insertions at many different times, which you would like to be able to do. So they focus just on computing properties of like, let's say the ground state wave function or the thermal density matrix, um, which are independent of time. Um, but yeah, I think this is a very promising uh, direction. And we might hope that uh, it may not be completely far-fetched to imagine that we could try to um, attack uh, general large and um, quantum mechanics or field theories, maybe in the somewhat distant future with uh, more computing power. Um, yeah, and finally, I should say that uh, 
you know, the conformal bootstrap was wonderful and uh, it has brought a huge wealth of things. Um, I, I would hope that the matrix bootstrap can also deliver some things. In particular, um, you might think of the conformal bootstrap as a way to sort of search for uh, or to constrain uh, conformal field theories. But the matrix bootstrap is, at least uh, even in the zero dimensional case, is a little bit like uh, constraining uh, or searching for um, uh, two dimensional conformal field theories coupled to quantum gravity, right? Uh, that's the case of the string theory. And even in this case, yeah, in general, there's some relation between large and matrix integrals and string theory. So um, by trying to solve matrix quantum mechanics, we might uh, be able to learn a lot about uh, string world sheet theories or something like that. Um, so that's uh, pretty much um, what I had to say. I'd be very happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. Um, and thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. A beautiful talk. Uh, any further questions? I have a comment. Mm -hmm. So, so you mentioned the large gen QCD applications. I just wanted to to mention the paper of Anderson and Kruchensky from two thousand sixteen. Yes. For two reasons, actually, I mean, because it, it was actually the first paper in the Simon's Bootstrap Collaboration online seminar series so oh, wow. four years ago. I, I didn't know that. And, uh, you know, so what, what he did, uh, what they did is that they considered the loop equation yes. in large NQCD on the lattice and they imposed positivity constraints just like you did. And then they managed to get some constraints on the value of the Plaquette-Wilson loop. Yes, yes. Uh, and at the time it didn't look like a big deal, but now with your paper, it actually looks like a pretty big deal, uh, except that um, the problem that you were solving was too complicated, so. <laughs> yes, yes. Anyway. I, I agree, yeah. That paper Congratulations on being able to find the gist of this idea where it works so well yeah thanks for the comment yeah that's a great paper and um yeah one comment on that is yeah exactly what you said they were stymied i think a little bit because in large n qcd the loop equations are quite complicated and there are many possible loops right uh, that's a little bit like the multi-matrix case that i i'm encountering except that well the complexity of their problem is much higher and i I believe they tried to get around this by having some sort of onsets for um, the form of the, you know, these plaquettes and then trying to constrain them using this onsets. Yeah, and in this, in the, yeah, in the single matrix case uh, and the multi-matrix cases, we didn't need to make any onsets just because our problem is simpler. Um, but yeah, I, I also think that... Um, I'm yeah. sorry, I don't believe they made any onsets. They just considered different loops of different shapes just like you considered certain number of words of different lengths, they considered different loops of different shapes. They do have any answers. Uh, okay, I mean, I believe there was an answer, but I could be mistaken. I mean, yeah. In general, you have some, well, yeah. If you have a Wilson loop of some arbitrary shape, it's hard to imagine how there, there's so many, uh, there's so many possible Wilson loops that it seems difficult to imagine how you could uh, how you could organize the calculation in a way so that it could be solved but i yeah no, but i'm sorry it's it's not so different from what you did so just take a, a cubic lattice introduce every lattice link as a separate matrix give it a number so we have a, a, a menu matrix model with the number of matrices being equal to the number of links on the lattice that's, so I, I agree that in principle so it's a maximally complicated case of your problem yes yes for sure uh, i i guess i would just be the reason why i say, say that it's a bit different it's not different in principle of course but in practice i think it's challenging because um well even in the cases where i considered only two matrices you have a very large search space and i didn't recall seeing a discussion of an extremely large search space in their problem so even if I just had like the simplest problem would be if you just have a cubic lattice, let's say with, you know, I don't know, 20 sites or something like that. I would have expected an enormous search space where you have to have a very high, you know, the number of unknown correlators that you need to, to input uh, in order to be able to solve for the rest of them would be very high based on these crude estimates that I have. Um, I could be wrong about that, but uh, I don't see how 
you could search through such a high dimensional space uh, with very little resources. If I recall, there was some sort of ansatz for, uh, it could have been a very reasonable ansatz for, um, uh, for the form, for the dependence of the Wilson loop, perhaps on the shape or something. I, if you have some ansatz for the loop equate for the correlators in general, of course, that reduces dramatically the. Um, uh, I mean, it's good to have an ansatz. If if you have a motivated ansatz, you should plug it into this program, right? Oh, but then, that's precisely the point. They didn't have any ansatz. Okay. So I mean, if they had an ansatz, then this changes the whole story because this is not bootstrap anymore. This is just some um, modeling. Yeah. Perhaps okay. maybe what you are referring to is that they did have some simplification that is not uh, that is in less con less under control than what you are doing which is that they truncate loops that become too big so the loop equations start changing the size of the loop and as soon as they become too big they were discarding them okay right? that's something that's, you are not doing, right you yes, you just yeah, no, I, I no i'm sorry they were not discarding anything they had a constraint that the loop of any size since they had unitary matrices they had a constraint that the loop of any size had to be smaller than one in absolute value that okay. was a rigorous constraint which they applied for very long loops, but it was not an ansatz. It was a rigorous constraint. Okay, I'm not qualified to discuss their paper, so I will stop trying to. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I will say another thing, which is that I, I believe that the approach that was just discussed in this Hartnell paper in this, that I just mentioned is interesting because they also consider other types of positivity, right? They consider reflection positivity. Uh, and I think. Yeah, if we want to solve something like a lattice field theory or something, we should probably use these other types of positivity too, which would presumably help. So I think, yeah, I, I don't know if all the structure of the lattice problem was used, but I think one of the nice things about this recent paper is to point out that yeah, we can exploit other types of positivity. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, you have studied central charge or half coupled to random lattice, which mm -hmm. is the Ising model. You have also mentioned briefly C equal one, uh, but there are matrix models with C larger than one, except that one cannot solve them. Uh, have you found anything on such model? Have you tried? Uh, I have not, well, I'm in the process of trying, but uh, I have not succeeded yet uh, in solving these types of models. I mean, okay. yeah. Thank you. The abstraction is just exactly what I've been talking about. The, it's just a numerical problem of um, having a very high dimensional search space and being confident that when you think that you're converging to a solution that you're actually converging to a solution and so forth. Good, thank you. Any further questions? <clears throat> so um, if not, uh, let's thank our speaker again. The talk will be online on the YouTube channel of the BUSA collaboration and uh, Pedro just sent the link to the chat uh, and the link will also be available. The last two Zoominars are already there. Thank you very much, Pedro. And then uh, eventually there will also be a link to the YouTube channel from our webpage. Thanks, everybody. And again, uh, the announcement is that next week, the seminar will be two hours earlier uh, at 10 a.m. Eastern, and it will be Damon Binder on uh, uh, ON models and the lean categories. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>